Let's, let's get started. The recording is in progress. Welcome again to the convergence on defending civic space uh, from militarism and authoritarianism. Um, the title of this afternoon's workshop being hosted in Phnom Penh, Cambodia at the ASEAN People's Forum, ASEAN Civil Society Conference is Protecting Civic Space and Ethnic Minorities in a Federal Democratic Myanmar Challenges and Opportunities. Um, I am your moderator today, Debbie Stothard, coordinator of Altsian Burma, one of the co-organizers, which also includes the Thai Action Committee for Democracy in Burma, TACDB, and Bridges MM, a youth online program to connect young people from different ethnic nationalities of Burma, Myanmar. Hopefully today at this workshop, we will be able to explore the challenges and opportunities that federalism presents for the country, explore Myanmar's federal democracy charter and the 12 step roadmap, highlight the role of civil society in security sector reform and governance in the future Federal Democratic Union of Myanmar. So um, we have a full program and I'm going to try to be as disciplined as possible given we had an inevitable late start um, by encouraging our uh, speakers to stay within time limits, which is a maximum of 10 minutes so that we have time for discussion. We have a very interesting mix of both distinguished and uh, troublemaker activists. And, um, and I would like to actually start, um, I'm gonna just give you a rundown of the program. We're going to start with Kun Baham Tan, the Deputy Minister for Human Rights from the National Unity Government, followed by a video message from Yasmin Ola, a, a Rohingya feminist and human rights activist, and then a presentation by Dr. Kin Mama Mio, the NUG Minister for Commerce, and then um, by a comment and an intervention from Kotet Sue Win from Synergy, and who is currently working to support the CDM members. And then a short video message from Shunling Ao from the Milk Tea Alliance. After that, we will have two reactors, Morte Ma from the Kareni State Constitution Drafting Committee and Shunling Ao who will join us uh, online. Oh, he's already in the room to respond to the statements made by our preceding speakers. And then we will have time for Q&A. So um, we will start soon, Kun, uh, Kun Baham Tan. Um, you're up first. Originally from Loiko Kareni State, Kun Baham Tan is the Deputy Minister for Human Rights. He studied in Taunji, where he completed a bachelor's degree in history and is currently based in Melbourne, Australia. Kun Baham Tan will share with us Myanmar's Federal Democracy Charter and the 12 step roadmap to a federal democratic constitution. We note that this is five steps more than the SPDC's 2003 Roadmap to Democracy. So welcome Kun Baham Tan and the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, do I need to open the video or should I uh, close? Up to me. We would love to continue seeing your handsome face, so please feel free. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, good. Good evening, everyone. Yes, it is an honor to join today's workshop on Federal Democratic Myanmar. I thank the organizer and I wish to acknowledge my distinguished group panelists too. As the Deputy Minister of Human Rights of National Unity Government, it is appropriate that I focus my comment on the protection of rights under a, few, uh, a new federal uh, system. In creating the blueprint for a future constitution, the Federal Democracy Charter set up clear rights-based values for our federal union. 
list includes the first one, fundamental rights for all, including minority and democratic rights. Second point is uh, equality and self determination. And the third, plural, plural listing. And fourth, unity in diversity. And number five is the gender equality. And number six, non discrimination across an important range of ground, including race, religion, language, culture, gender, disability, status, and sexual orientation. The, the charter also addressed specific category of rights, including first, fundamental rights, and second part is economy, social, and cultural rights. The third part is child rights, and the fourth is uh, labor rights and farmer rights. Father is provide special measure to protect and advance ethnic community and equality. I'm sure we can all agree that this vision captures the spirit of our revolution. But the practical delivery of this right and achievement that hasn't been secured in the past seven decades is a very different proposition. In the short time that I have, I will ident identify seven issues that I consider critical to realizing the Federal Democracy Charter vision. Um, sorry, Kun Bahantan. Yes. Do you have headphones? Uh, I think the people in the room in Phnom Penh are finding it a little bit difficult to hear you. Would you happen to okay. have headphones? Uh, my phone is uh, near to my computer. That's why, sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, do you have headphones? The no? Oh, no, no, I, I, I don't have it. Okay. Please uh, I, try I, I, to speak a little bit louder and nearer to your computer. Okay, how about... I'm so I, sorry. I, yeah, yes, no worries. Is... How about I come closer? Yes, thank you so much. Sorry is about that. Is it clear that. now? Yeah. Is it clear okay. now, Brishan? Yeah? Okay, thank you. All right. So, um, you can continue my discussion. Yes, please and... proceed. Yeah. First is citizenship and belonging. Belonging and uh, inclusion are the foundation upon which all other rights are built. We must treat them as priority of the highest order. The NUG is committed to amending the citizenship law and other laws to correct the history discrimination and exclusion that Yama minority, including the Rohingya that suffer. So we must add on this commitment now. Second is the protection of civil space and civil society. We cannot have junior conversation and consultation on our future until fundamental freedoms such as expression, opinion, and association are fully protected. We need to have vibrant debates to shape our nation. And that's really about a dynamic civil society and safe civil platform. So the third point is ensuring that our democracy is truly representative. Candidate for office must be drawn from every community and we must invest heavily in de democratic education. This education needs to cover what democracy and pluralism look like. The second point is the role of voter and the responsibility of office holders. The third is the various forms of democratic participation. Without a truly representative democracy, our law and policy will be hollow. First is uh, implementing structure change. The structure and the shape of our institution must be fit for democratic purpose. They must promote access to justice and respect procedural fairness. They especially the military must be subject to civilian oversight. They must treat all persons equally, regardless of their status or origin. They must be culturally appropriate and susceptible to all. Fifth is genuine national reconciliation. This will be required for more mechanism to set up our continuing grievance and to address past atrocities through recognition. 
recognition, preparation, and clear step to prevent recurrent. We cannot move forward before first facing our path. The sixth is justice and accountability. Without justice, there can be no peace. And there can be no amnesty for atrocity crime. Perpetrator of serious crime must be prosecuted to the full extent of international law. It is but impunity that paved the way of the illegal military junta escalating as of terrorists across Myanmar. That is uh, the first I'm discussing about Myanmar Federal Democracy Charter. And the second part is I would like to continue with the 12 step roadmap for to a federal democratic, democratic constitution. We all know already NUG and NUCC are now, we are trying to implement step-by-step -step with our 12 step roadmap. So I would like to mention a bit about the 12 step roadmap, what we are going and in, in a process now. First, you may see the first step to mobilize and create and support the mass government, including CDN, in order to completely end the military coup to eradicate all sorts of dictatorship, including military dictatorship, so that the Federal Democratic Union could be established. This is the first step. The second step is to cooperate in respective sector through the formation of committee representing parliament with the elected member of parliament. The third step is to develop a platform where allied political party, ethnic resistance organization, the civil society organization, including union, women, youth, and minority concern groups share collaborate to deliberate political agreement and implement the action plan. The first step is to draft and ratify the Federal Democracy Charter. Five step is to form international unity government, legislative <coughs> and judiciary institution in accordance with the, uh, this charter. Number uh, Roman step number three is to call a people assembly with the preparation of all food with common goal of the ultimate end of dictatorship and establishment of the Federal Democratic <coughs> Union. Step seven, to develop the strategy to end dictatorship, to abrogate to the 2008 constitution and to establish Federal Democratic Union. Step eight, to draft a transitional constitution. Step nine, to form a transitional government. Step 10, to draft and endorse the Federal Democratic Constitution by covenant the Constitutional Assembly. Step 11, to ratify the Federal Democratic Constitution endorsed by the Constitutional Assembly by holding a referendum and holding election. The last point, the last step, to form legislative and executive and judiciary body as far the ratify federal democratic constitution and to, party, to, party, to practice constitutionalism. According to the 12 step of Roma, you may see that we are now, the uh, Roma step number eight, we are trying and uh, drafting a transitional constitution process right now. This is uh, the current uh, process. So finally, I would like to uh, conclude and as a good international as the uh, must meet and build on its international commitment. The NUG accepts all Myanmar obligations under interna international law, including the human rights treaties we are party to and we are actively seeking to add new ratification. We will continue our campaign for recognition to the Gambia case before the International Court of Justice. And for the International Criminal Court to expand its investigation into Myanmar. We will keep cooperating with UN mechanism and experts. 
Myanmar must reshape itself into a nation that other look at a resemble. Thank you very much. It's all. Thank you very much, Kun Baham Tan, for sharing uh, the roadmap and the um, for sharing the roadmap and for sharing uh, the principles. Um, do we have your permission to share your paper with the participants? Uh, is it okay for us to share your paper? Yes, I will share. Uh, yeah, of course, I can share to. I think I already sent to some people already this. Uh... Okay, I will ask uh, May, our reporter, to share it if if it's more convenient. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's, that of course, I can share it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you yeah, so no much for thank that. Um, yeah, it's, you, are, um, you are welcome. Thank you. And um, we actually, uh, it's been uh, heartening to uh, uh, encouraging to hear that equality and self-determination are at the heart of these principles, but also inclusion and belonging, including that of the Rohingya, uh, an important part of the roadmap that you outlined for us and um, and that um, that addressing injustices of the past are necessary for us to move forward into the future uh, understanding that atrocity crimes cannot be forgiven um, that, that that impunity has to be addressed especially this has been a particularly ugly legacy in Burma uh, Burma, Myanmar, for all the ethnic minorities, including the Rohingya. On that note, we actually are in a position to uh, connect to the next presentation. Uh, Brishan, are you ready? Um, uh, we are going to have a short video message uh, recorded recently by uh, Miss Yasmin Ola, a Rohingya feminist and human rights activist listed on the Feminist 1000 of 2021. She is also the board, the board chair for Altsian Burma. And here we are to hear something from Yasmin concerning the Rohingya and ethnic minorities. So in Myanmar right now, there are various different uh, mechanism and, uh, and uh, uh, entities uh, like the National Unity Government and the NUCC and various others uh, to ensure that democracy not only is applied to just, you know, election and overturning of the coup or, or eradicating the military power would be imperative in, in ensuring that our democracy is not only, uh, uh, you know, becoming realized or, you know, becoming actualized, but also the fact that it, it will be sustainable in the future. So one election is not going to cut it. Um, overturning the coup, not going to cut it. We need to ensure that the federal uh, democracy starts from a very, very rudimentary places where things like that might not happen before. Um, in, in places like social economic uh, uh, areas um, to ensure that when dispossession, exploitation of ethnic rights um, or, or lands happen, that there are mechanisms that actually ensure that that can actually be you know uh, held accountable so there are so many various other ways that we can actually explore but but to to summarize it for you democracy needs to happen in all of the places in every you know at every table that decisions are made um, on people's lives on on the well-being of the country but also in the places that uh, most excluded groups would not be um, and so for example, in the case of myself and, and my people and other ethnic groups um, who are often not given a seat at the table, um, civil society needs to make sure that those groups who are marginalized and invisibilized are at the table even more so now than ever and ensure that um, the, the invisibilized groups are always part and parcels of those decisions that are made and are not just given the seat to the ta at the table to just listen, but given the seat at the table to make decisions and push the country forward and actually their ideas are heard. Um, so I think that's, that's the best way forward. The easiest thing that the civil society groups can do is to ensure that they hold the NUG accountable, especially on the Rohingya issue. I think that people often forget that um, 
you know, the NUG might have just basically released statements and, and said that now we accept Rohingya, but the acceptance alone would not fix the genocide and decades of violence that, that have been structurally uh, designed. Therefore, the civil society groups need to ensure that all of these structures, all of these different mechanisms that are in place currently are criticized, are scrutinized to its very, very, uh, uh, very rudimentary level, very primary level to ensure that we're not leaving behind anybody. Um, and in the Rohingya case, and I'm, I'm talking a lot for the Rohingya because we are the group that are excluded the most and we do not want anyone to end up where we are. Um, so therefore, one of the ways that the NUG can actually, or the civil society groups can actually push for the NUG to, to, to do more is to ensure that accountability mechanism are in place, um, not only for you know, the war crimes that are happening uh, all across the country, but to ensure that uh, crimes that are happening to the Rohingya eventually have some sort of mechanism that will um, go on to hold all of the perpetrators accountable, not just the generals. Um, on top of that, the NUG needs to find ways to actually um, implement what they're preaching, which is how do they plan to integrate Rohingya? the over, you know, many millions of people that are outside the country right now. There needs to be a concrete steps that the NUG take so that none of the other groups or marginalized groups would ever have to end up in, in the places that we are at again. And uh, lastly, um, the civil society groups have so much power because this is an opening. Um, right now, it may feel like the sense of hope is no longer here, but it is an incredible opportunity for the civil society to actually draft and, and craft a place, a country that we want to see, that we all want to live in with peace, security, with equality in, uh, uh, in mind. And you know, the only way we can go uh, is up from here. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. And that was Yasmin Ola, uh, who was speaking about the necess necessity of inclusion of Rohingya and other ethnic minorities, not just at the table, but actually for them to be heard and to be part of the decision-making process, which is very much in line with the presentation of our Deputy Minister for Human Rights, Kun Baham Tan. Next up, we have Dr. Kin Mama Mio. Originally from Taonji, Southern Shan State, Dr. Kin Mama Mio is the current Minister of Commerce for the National Unity Government and was previously Deputy De Minister for Defense. She was a professor in the Department of International Relations at the University of Yangon, where she taught about peace and security and identity issues in the Asia Pacific. She's also founder of the Yangon-based Myanmar Institute for Peace and Security Studies. The minister will present on protection and promotion of civic space, the role of civil society in security sector governance of future Myanmar. But before we start, minister, welcome. Um, I would actually um, want to carry forward some of the points raised by the Deputy Home Minister, sorry, uh, Home Affairs, uh, sorry, not Home Affairs, Human Rights Minister, pardon me, and also the issues raised by Yasmin Ola, um, that NUG statements acknowledging Rohingya identity are not enough. And when it comes to preventing genocidal acts and crimes against humanity by the security sector, it would be particularly important for um, active inclusion and protection of all minorities and Rohingya in all the spaces of the NUG. Um, would you agree with that? Right, okay, uh, first of all, um, uh, well, uh, let me uh, cl clarify first. Uh, actually, there are two, two Kimama Mews in uh, political and uh, international relations field. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, well, uh, I think the identity has been uh, missed uh, due to our name identity. So actually, there is another Kimama Mew, uh, 
from the Rangoon Peace uh, International Relation uh, Department Professor. Uh, well, she she is uh, she she is a, a kind of a professor who have. Uh, uh, achieve a PhD already in Dr. Kim Mamu. And then uh, for me, I'm Kim Mamu who have studied in uh, UK. It, but uh, actually, our backgrounds are uh, mixed up uh, every time for nearly uh, 20 years. And then, uh, well, she, she gets uh, some problems with this. And then for me, I. Uh, some problem because I was uh, being accused uh, sometimes uh, uh, or be, uh, being um, well, so, so some people misunderstood because of her writings and sometimes because of my writings as well, she was uh, being being uh, uh, misunderstood by her uh, surrounding uh, people. So actually, I would like to clarify that they are two Kimama news already and then I was in introduced with uh, this identity. So actually, uh, well, I'm, I'm a democratic uh, activist. Uh, and then also I study in the UK and I work for a democratic organization. And later I went back to Myanmar in 2013 uh, to participate in uh, Myanmar peace process, uh, as well as uh, a promotion of uh, democracy and federalism uh, in the country. And I would like to respond uh, based on the question. Uh, well, uh, as far as I understand, uh, actually atrocities and then the attempts uh, actually come out of the uh, prejudice and then uh, stereotypes and discrimination. So uh, we need to uh, capture the explicit measures of feelings, social distance, and, uh, and social dominance origin as well as the implicit measures of the response latency, physiological attitude. For in Myanmar, actually, uh, well, uh, especially Rohingya people uh, were excluded socially and politically. And then there has been a lot of uh, prejudice discrimination and stereotype attempts uh, that were mainstream into the perceptions of the society. So now uh, we are in the NUG government and we need to accept the situation that, uh, well, actually the rise of militarism and then also the perceptions of society has contributed to these forms of uh, uh, cruel atrocities uh, against the Rohingya people. And so in this case, we need to accept uh, uh, this uh, uh, atrocity that has already happened and we need to prevent uh, not to happen again. In this case, uh, we need to change the perceptions of the society being imposed by the military and then uh, and also the discrimination norms and discrimination practices uh, being contributed by the military and authoritarian practices uh, to the promising directions of social inclusion in and then uh, mutual respect among the society, as well as social inclusion to the integrated personal constructs of our individuals. So oh, we need to have a promising direction not to happen again in our society and in our country. And we need to accept this has already, uh, uh, it, it, it has uh, happened in our country. And then uh, we need to apologize and we need to give a public apology uh, to the society. And we need to address injustice as well as we need to change the direction to a promising direction of social inclusion in our society as well as in our uh, country. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Kim Amamiu, um, uh, Dr. Kim Amamiu, Minister. Um, I, I was sent um, some information and I just wanted to clarify. So you are not the Dr. Kim Amamiu who equated the genocide and forced deportation of Rohingya as cleaning a house and 
implying that Rohingya were insects and worms. It, that wasn't you? Right. Uh, there was some misunderstanding as well. Uh, well, actually, actually I'm, I'm glad that uh, you clarified this uh, information uh, about uh, yeah, in 2005, I was in uh, UK and I was a political activist, uh, actually. And in 2005, there was a kind of uh, uh, report about genocide in Burma. And at that time, I was the Burmese uh, 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 the editor of uh, Burma Digest magazine in UK that promote democracy. And uh, at the time, I openly uh, uh, wrote an article about genocide in Burma, and I addressed the situation of uh, uh, the the Rohingya as well as uh, Korean people based on how kind of then uh, report uh, at, at the time and then since uh, 2005 uh, I was aware of the situation and then I promoted uh, uh, by democratic means but in 2007 there was a misunderstanding uh, 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 situation happened uh, the thing is at the time I was suffering uh, from uh, autoimmune and then my autoimmune disease was uh uh well actually uh related to the uh the the incest uh at the time uh, i have i have got all the medical records uh uh, of uh, my autoimmune. So even when uh, in, uh, when a mosquito or bites me, uh, well, I need to go to the A and E at the time. I so I have been to thirty uh, uh, medical uh, situation uh, related to the uh, the mosquitoes, and then also the the ends uh, 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 at the time. So my house was uh, uh, in in uh, in Yangon. Uh, well, I have got a little boy and then I have got the mother, uh, the, the old, old mother, elderly mother, and then we have no uh, no helper. So there were a lot of uh, incest. And then when I came back uh, from my uh, uh, trip, uh, I found a lot of ants uh, on my, uh, in, in the kitchen and then on all the places. Uh, so I had an argument with uh, my mom and then uh, because out of my emotion, I wrote this, but uh, 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 unfortunately it was the time uh, that was uh, being, uh, uh, the, the, the discrimination against uh, Rohingya was being promoted. So I was being accused and then I was uh, misunderstood. Uh, at first, uh, I tried I try several times uh, to explain about the situation, but uh, later later I got a breast cancer situation, and then it was the autoimmune and the hormone uh, chain uh, pattern. So so I stopped explaining about the situation, and also the other one thing is when I was being accused and then being politicized. Uh, at that time, uh, yes, uh, I felt I felt that I was the one uh, who promoted and who wrote this uh, genocide in Burma article uh, in uh, since two thousand five. I and then uh, I was a little bit uh, how to say being angry for being accused of uh, this uh, wrongful uh, due to my medical situation. So I thought uh, a bit based on how how to say. Uh, Based on my emotion, I thought that no, oh, if I being accused like this, okay, I will, I will, I will stop all oh my good work, and then I will not uh, do anything anymore, and then I will not explain anymore. Let them accuse like this kind of uh, response uh, I had done, but actually later I found out that maybe I need to explain to the uh, the Reddit, uh, uh, the, uh, Reddly to the communities that have been suffered that uh, it was being misunderstood. So uh, from today, I would like to apologize uh, uh, to all the communities and then to all the people uh, being, uh, being uh, how, how to say, uh, uh, so psychologically that I wrote like this, but uh, actually I was not this person who wrote this. I come from ethnic minority background and then I have uh, several mis, mis uh, identity as well uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, 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 uh, from UK. 
okay, because my great grandfather was not from Myanmar, from UK. Uh, so actually, I'm a mixed blood, and then I don't need to discriminate other people uh, by promoting uh, the, the like promoting like uh, the discrimination norms like this. Uh, so so actually, uh, I think it was a misunderstanding. But uh, I I didn't how to say I haven't explained. A, uh, in time, and then uh, I responded by the other way. So uh, from today on, uh, actually, I I started uh, uh, explaining uh, behind the scenes uh, since that time. But uh, well, in public, I haven't done apology yet. But from today, I I will. Uh, uh, yes, uh, from from today, I would like to announce that. Uh, actually, I was not intended to do this, but uh, for this, uh, uh, if it it's uh, if it is uh, escalated uh, beyond my thinking, uh, and then uh, if uh, people uh, being suffer psychologically, I would like to apologize. I would like to do public apology. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. you so much, uh, uh, Minister. So um, uh, we look forward to seeing the written. Um, and formal apology, but thank you for using this opportunity to make a public apology for the hurt and misunderstanding um, that um, uh, that what that this comment, uh, this public comment caused. Um, so please, uh, you have ten minutes to do your presentation. So please proceed. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Uh, so uh, today I would like to uh, present uh, uh, about the role of uh, civil society and then uh, uh, in the governance of future Myanmar and protection and promotion of uh, civic uh, space. Uh, so actually, uh, I will start with uh, the civic space, the definition of civic Space. Promotion and protecting civil space has been defined in terms of the set of cases institutional and predatory conditions necessary for non-governmental actors to assess information, express and serve, assist, organize and participate in public, public life. It is a precondition for good governance and uh, inclusive growth. So, uh, for for democracy, civic space is an important issue. Civic space is the bedrock of any open and democratic society and place in which uh, communities uh, can uh, operate. And uh, so when to, civic sorry, Minister, is... can you can you go to full screen? Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. When civil space is open, citizens and civil society organizations are able to organize, participate and communicate uh, without hindrance. In doing so, they can be uh, able to uh, claim their rights and influence the political and social structures around them. Uh, having civil space that is open is an important for community-based and particularly community-led organization to function at full capacity. So the dimensions of uh, civil space, if we have to protect and promote uh, civil space, we need to set up the policies, laws, institutions and practices uh, in four dimensions related to citizen CSO participation, media and digital rights and freedom, CSO enabling environment, and as well as uh, the access to information and freedom of association. Uh, all these uh, dimensions needs to be addressed if we do uh, the, if we protect and promote uh, civil space. So in this case, uh, we have to identify how could we uh, promote and protect uh, uh, civil space in terms of security center governance. Security center governance is about the process by which uh, accountable security institution transparently supply security as a public good uh, via transparent policies and practices. So accountability of security institutions have been important. 
in the role of uh, security sector governance and the, uh, its uh, understanding and then implementation of security sector governance measures were in, uh, in a bad form, not in a good shape uh, throughout Myanmar history. So uh, if we establish uh, a new nation to serious as well democratic governance of the security sector by enhancing citizen safety and public security, by strengthening security provision, by enabling democratic institutions to monitor and amend security policy and practice, and then uh, to uh, by inventing transparency and accountability of mechanism. Uh, when I look at the human rights history of the country, uh, the military and then the police uh, from the security sector institutions, they have committed a lot of atrocities, a lot of violations of human rights. There was no organization, even the government level, uh, uh, actually to monitor and amend the security sector policy and practices. And then in the, 2008 constitution has a lot of limited clause uh, uh, well, that restrict uh, the monitoring and evaluation mechanisms by the civil society as well as the civilian government. And so in this case, uh, I think if we would like to establish a new federal country, actually we need to promote democratic governance of the security is set in the near future uh, by providing effective check and balance to ensure that security sector actors cannot commit any more abuses or human rights uh, violations. So in this case, we have to establish the process of democratic governance in the security sector. Uh, uh, UN aligns uh, four uh, sorry, stages of areas of focus in the process. Uh, it's about to strengthen the national legal framework. Now, government engaging uh, uh, in this case. And then another one is uh, strengthen the civil society role and capacity. If we have to, uh, we have to enhance uh, our capacity as well as uh, our efforts uh, to role and capacity for establishing democratic governance in the security sector, as well as we need to institutional chain and institutional form and another management system and internal oversight mechanism needs to be established. So uh, we need to change some of the security sector government policy. And uh, one issue in Ma is uh, a lot of people uh, have understanding on security sector, especially uh, not, not, not the civil society, especially the government, as well as the members of parliament, that security is uh, in, their, in their mindset, uh, they thought security is only related to uh, the Ministry of Defense and uh, Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, military, police, and then just institution. But uh, actually, security sector governance should be based on human security, the perspective of human security uh, uh, policy should be integrated in the future security governance. And we need to promote, as uh, uh, I have mentioned, of civil society and security, such a government uh, by various means like facilitating dialogue and debate on policy issues, as well as uh, improving the legitimacy of uh, policy process and presenting the interests of the group and providing a pool of independent expertise, information and perspective and promote uh, transparency and accountability of security institution, in, as well as uh, maintaining sustained policies, uh, scrutiny, and promoting uh, responsive and creating and mobilizing a of systematic public opposition to undemocratic and unrepresented local and national government. 
as well as we need to uh, strengthen the oversight capacity of the security sector. This is a trait of a solid democratic state to make sure that state resources are managed efficiently and effectively and the security personnel behaves with order and integrity. Mistakes are detected and corrected and those who commit them are held accountable. So being held accountability is an important oversight and scrutiny are important for the security sector. So in this case, uh, well, main ways of CSO in security sector oversight uh, can be developed uh, in terms of discussions around security related issue as a watchdog and facilitating dialogue and negotiation and then through advocacy campaigns as well as service delivery and provision of alternate sources of security and justice issues and for to do this CSO as a crucial agent for security sector governance and oversight and we need to promote the role of civil society to play a role in democratic control of various uh, security sector. Sometimes we promote democratic control of and forces. It is not enough because all security, including the private security, adults are being controlled by the military. So we need to establish and we need to promote society in the democratic control of all security sector forces, including ANSYS, police, inter intelligence service, and also uh, technical expertise uh, should be enhanced. The, the next point I would like to mention is uh, accountability of security sector. Security sector must be held accountable. And then uh, the one who committed uh, crimes, uh, they should be held accountability. So in the form of information accessibility, consultation and direct sanctions as a consequence of certain decision and indirect consequences due to certain decision, they all need to be a help of the accountability. So, uh, well, uh, this is uh, this is the presentation I would like to make. And then in, sum in summary, we need to promote and protect the civil space uh, uh, in terms of security sector governance in future Myanmar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ken Mamamil, uh, Minister for Commerce. Um, we will now move on to uh, the next civil society speaker, uh, Kotetsue Wen, a veteran, veteran civil society activist who, uh, who set up and runs Synergy, a very important NGO in Burma aimed at promoting greater understanding and solidarity between diverse communities. Um, more recently, Kotet has been assisting members of the CDM who have had to go into hiding since the attempted, attempted coup. Kotet, you are supposed to share with us the role of civil society in the development of the Federal Democracy Charter. Welcome, and the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Um, thank you, Debbie. Hello, everyone. Good evening. And so goodbye to my, my friend. And it's been already 10 years since I first tried the ASEAN Youth Forum and ASEAN People Forum in Phnom Penh. Time flies. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, let me introduce again myself. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I've introduced, um, yeah, I'm the executive director of the Synergy, the Social Harmony Organization. And also, uh, I'm the the one of the uh, civil society representatives to NUCC as well. So I'm like involved in all of the mass, and yeah, and also I've been uh, I've been activist um, of the development of of, of this important uh, political uh, development. So yeah, our, our human rights minister, uh, the deputy human rights minister, also have mentioned about the the roadmap of the uh, the development of the charter and also the the, the processes. 
And I would also like to uh, talk a little bit about the charter and also about my civil society perspective and activist perspective uh, of the current political situation of Burma. And yeah, the NUCC, we have um, five pillars, uh, the, the found, found with, with five pillars that um, one is the uh, elected body that including CRP and also other elected um, uh, political entities. And also the second one is the political parties. The entity was there before, now they left out and only one political party left the TPNS. And also the, uh, the civil societies and unions and women, youth and minority organizations, we call it like a Supreme Revolution uh, groups, uh, Supreme Revolution forces, including the strike committees after the revolution, uh, founded after the revolutions, and also the ethnic revolution uh, organizations and the state in, uh, and ethnic interim uh, units. So they are the, the pillars of the uh, NUCC, the ones that is doing the, uh, uh, like, you know, behind the NUG that doing all of the, you know, the, the, the processes. And uh, the, the charter, we have the fundamental union values uh, that have to, uh, like when we develop the, the, uh, the, the constitution, then that all of these values have to be based on that. So we have like nine values that according to the charter, that uh, fundamental human rights, democratic rights, minority rights, uh, equality and self-determination, collective leadership, pluralism, mutual respect and mutual recognition, uh, unity and diversity, gender equality and non-discrimination. So these are the values that we, the activists and the civil societies uh, <clears throat> always, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, raising our voices out. So these are the values that reflect in, uh, in the uh, charter. And also uh, the charter uh, clearly stated that you know, that uh, it, every processes of the constitutional things or like the, the government or whatever, uh, to uh, have 30%, minimum 30% of the women participation. That is also, you know, uh, granted in the charter. And also the charter is like, um, uh, also uh, uh, like granted to form the commissions, like if we are needed, like for, I don't want to, 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 to say it much, but you know, many of these commissions are the right based commissions to protect the civilians' rights, like you know, uh, minority rights commissions or women rights commission, child rights commissions or like labor rights commission. And, but many of the right based uh, commissions uh, can be formed according to the charter. And also, uh, according to the charter part two, we have the uh, 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 stated that you know, NUG uh, can work together with the civil societies. So that is also one good point that, you know, we, the civil societies and that, that you know, all of the, the, the NUG or NUCC that can, we can also work together in the, in the trying commissions or like, you know, in many other cases as well. And, uh, but yeah, these are the some, some things that I would like to, you know, highlight according to the charter, but, uh, here is the part, the, uh, the real work on, on the actual situation on the ground. Um, the civil societies and the activists are actually being accused by the people. Uh, most of the people who are like, you know, there are a lot of, you know, fragments and also like, you know, spectrums in the, in the, uh, in the revolutions. And we, the civil society and the activists are always being labeled and framed as a threat of every time. Like the previous government, they also see as a threat of the of the development of the government. And even in this revolution, we the civil society and the activists are the threat of the revolution. So we we kept you know being accused, you know, and then uh, by many different ways and many different uh, you know uh, uh, corners. But uh, the activists, we uh, we keep doing what we have to do, and we keep saying what we believe. So. Um, yeah, the, the previously, uh, Shema Kimama Mew was also, uh, she made a, 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 an apology about, you know, uh, uh, about her statement on the Rohingya people. 
And also, uh, actually, um, we uh, actually like you know push and as an NUCC, you know, we push the NUG to make a national apology. Uh, we even made a statement on the uh, 75th uh, anniversary of the Loan Agreement this year. Uh, in their statement, the NUCC actually, uh, you know, uh, encouraged NUG to make the national apology uh, uh, or to, to uh, that all of the mistakes have done by the successive government. But NUG, uh, they haven't done anything yet. So I also uh, push and approach to many different uh, uh, ministries um, to you know do this kind of thing, but they only make like you know um, a personal apology, but not as a uh, as a whole government yet. So this is the thing that needs to be done. I'm glad that Shamaki Mama Mu has made an apology, but there's also one other minister in NUG that uh, being accused by the international and local communities and activists uh, for supporting genocide, that NUG have to take accountable uh, and also the individual uh, person also has to take accountable, you know, for this. So, and because like, while we're talking about the transition adjusting, so these things need to be done first, that uh, making an apology, but uh, without the apology, we cannot uh, really go forward. And how can we, you know, include if we, while we're talking about the inclusion. So how can we include, like, you know, to those minorities who are being, you know, perpetrated by those you know, by these people? So like, uh, we need to make the apology first. So these are the things that we, the civil society, where, um, where, uh, like, you know, uh, where, where where urging to the NUG, and also uh, many of the civil society leaders inside the country, we are in the very difficult situation as you all may be aware of and some of them are like being killed and being arrested and also uh, some of the activists and fearful leaders are uh, being uh, you know the the joint uh, military the, the, the joint you know armed forces of some of them even you know leading armed forces to fight back the military and you know um the situation of the society is really getting worse because um, both sides, I mean, the revolutionary side and also the, the, the military hunter, they are being too extreme. That, I, that is really you know, understandable. But we, the revolutionary side, we have to be, uh, uh, we have to take like, you know, more high ground. You know, we are better than them. We are actually fighting injustice of the military. So we cannot repeat or re or like you know, or do the same as the the fascist military has tend to act. But what we are seeing right now in the society and also in the revolutionary group is that you know people are being more extreme and making othering uh, to them. And and also like you know, as a human rights defenders, you know, human rights is for everyone. You know, we cannot you know make different to the you know to those you know, military people to those people who support military. You know, so that is really a very thin boundaries that we have to make the determination and uh, the NUG and also the NUCC as well, that we have to uh, make a very clear uh, statement or like clear instructions, uh, especially to the revolutionary groups. But um, they, the society gets, is now getting extreme uh, by the both uh, uh, entities. That is uh, what I'm seeing. I'm really worried about that because uh, right now we are talking about the charter or the constitutional thing or whatever. But all these things can only be done after the revolution, after we win the revolution. But during this time, you know, it's really uh, the the people inside the country are suffering, and then you know they are afraid uh, of being you know bombarded or being kid or you know many different situations from both sides you know especially in the center of Burma you know the the the, the they are all, I, I I'm always like connecting with people over there like you know why I'm supporting people they said like I have to afraid PDF and also I have to afraid the military so they came because when the PDF came then you know they of course we all support PDF and you know they are they are fighting against the military but after that, the military will come 
to their villages and destroy everything. So, and uh, the respect, when we talk about the human rights and respecting human rights uh, to everyone, that is a big challenge when we especially talk to the people in the battlefield that they said, you know, they all already have the trauma and they all have experience of all of the, you know, the, the situations that their relatives were killed and everything. So how can they overcome it? How can, can they respect the human rights? Because we, the civil society, uh, are meant to be defending the human rights in any situation. But it's really making a challenge, uh, especially to me, because when I talk to my friends, they said, okay, how will you react if, if you were me? Like if you were, you know, experienced as me that, you know, my friends were being killed in better fee, how will you do that? So it's really a big challenge uh, of the situation right now. And also, um, the, the, as Yasmin said, that the inclusion of the, of the minorities, that uh, I am still seeing that, uh, that minorities, ethnic groups or, you know, whatever minorities are just uh, being as a, what is it, as a token of this, you know, process. So there is no uh, genuine process of the minority participation yet. So this is what we are pushing forward. That this is what I want to see, that, you know, we want uh, the real participation and real leadership of the ethnic minorities, that we don't want to see any you know, majority political parties or any majority ethnic cities are leading this country anymore. Then when we talk about the federalism, then we really need to practice federalism, uh, practice uh, federal value as well. Like there were many, especially in the Karani area that our Karani colleague will talk about it later. Like, you know, there should be a clear line in between NUG and also the, the what is it, the, the federal units, you know, for the practice in their, uh, their, their power to rule their regions. Then it should be done a lot of uh, processes. But uh, I still have hope and I still believe that uh, our revolution is uh, is going uh, to the right directions, even though we have a lot of frictions in between, but we are going to the right direction to win the revolution. But uh, we need a lot of, we need to put a lot of effort to make it happen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Kumate uh for that realistic and also very deep analysis and sharing of the challenges that uh, we are facing, we are encountering in this very big project to uh, achieve for the history, for the first time in Burma, Myanmar's history, a genuine federal union, and and while at the same time conducting a revolution. Um, we are also having a very interesting exchange going on in the chat box. Um, um, so we are having several parallel tracks uh, during this workshop, but I'm, I, I would uh, like to also appreciate our friends who are sitting in the room in Phnom Penh. I hope those of you who attended the first workshop, uh, uh, which was supposed to be about whether there's light at the end of the tunnel for Myanmar, can also appreciate that um, this is one of the processes that actually have to bring us closer to that light at the end of the tunnel. And thank you for uh, to Kota Tsuiwin for um, emphasizing that token inclusion of all of the various ethnic minorities, including the Rohingya, is not uh, is not acceptable, and that we still need to move forward in ensuring there's real participation and real leadership. Um, as we work uh, for, uh, uh, for a federal democracy based on equality and inclusion and justice. Um, the next two speakers coming up are actually uh, going to be uh, responding and reacting to the previous presenters. And um, it is um, my pleasure to introduce uh, Motema. Motema, are you here in the room? Um, she's from Kareni State. Motema is an NUCC member and the technical support person of the Kareni State Constitutional 
Drafting Committee, KNSCDC. Now, before I give the floor to you for 10 minutes, I also wanted to note that in the first year since the coup started, Kareni people were subjected to extreme violence by the illegal junta. The state capital, Loikor, was subjected to airstrikes. For many of you, that would have been shocking if your state capital had been subjected to airstrikes. And when we looked at the data and statistics, at the violence suffered per capita in each state and, and region, we found that the people in Kareni state in the first year of the coup were 32 times higher at risk of military violence than someone who was living in Rakhine state. Um, so uh, it is extremely special that we have had two people from Kareni state uh, in this session, Kun Bahan Tan, the deputy uh, human rights minister. And now um, I give the floor to Mote Ma to react and respond uh, to the previous speakers. Over to you and welcome. Yes, uh, Debbie, thank you for giving me opportunity to try these uh, interesting events. And uh, I'm uh, Motema from uh, Ken SCDC, uh, Kenya State Traffic Committees. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, share about uh, uh, in instead of reaction with our, what we feel, our ethnic people feels. Uh, we believe that the, uh, the civil war and the conflict in Burma is caused by the constitutional problems. The, the 70 year civil war in our country and the armed conflict around the ethnic area that happened because of the constitutional problem. That is because the successes of uh, military regimes and the government, they are not adherent to the federal, uh, to the bail agreements and also because of the centralized constitution. Uh, so we, we think that by, we can only solve the, the root cause of the uh, the root cause of the problem by by uh, drafting a new constitution that will ensure the rights of ethnic uh, that will protect the rights of ethnic people and guarantee guarantees uh, that the, our rights and uh, give us uh, the self determination to govern ourselves and and our our lands. So uh, as the the civil wars, the wars, uh, the seventy years war, is caused a lot of. Uh, a, a lot of cause that and lose to the, all the people of Burma. And with this now, uh, the reset military coups uh, events uh, is cause, is take away our hopes that we that uh, we are moving to the democracy uh, in, the, in the last test year, but it's taken away, away of this hope and and uh, and it's caused a lot, a lot of uh, lost life uh, in the recent, in this year and last years. Uh, but at the same time, it's also bring together uh, the different Groups of people to come together and work for a new, uh, a new future uh, federal democracy of Burma, and this is a new hope. Uh, we have a glimmer of hope because all the group for different, a uh, different walk of, of life. They come together as uh, my colleagues already say in uh, NUG and also in NUCC. NUCC is inclusive. It's not very inclusive yet, but uh, it's try to inclusive as as much as it can and. There are many groups in the NUCC, and uh, this NUCC is trying to develop uh, federal's, uh, federal democracies, uh, principles, and guidelines. So uh, this is a new hope for us, and and also is including uh, the uh, the civil society, many groups civil society in the NUCC, and uh, and one at this one achievement of NUCC is to uh, they they. Uh, they called uh, ratifies the federal democracy charters. And this is one achievement, but at the same time, there is also a lot of challenges. As uh, our deputy minister of human rights uh, already mentioned, uh, there are a lot of challenges for, uh, the, for the future uh, federal constitution that we have to consider. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, for the citizenships. As uh, we have discussed a bit, uh, uh, citizenships and possession has been a, a big challenge in Burma. Uh, and many group are and uh, and exclusive uh, and included and included from from this right. So uh, this uh, the uh, citizenship rights uh, should be drafted against and also others uh, other many many other line issue and at least the 
most important is we need structural change. Uh, we need a structural change in the country to solve this, uh, this uh, rooted issue. Uh, and uh, we have even, uh, Burma have become more independent for 70 years, but uh, many of the ethnic people feel that they, they are not belonging to the countries because their, their right is, is excluded. Uh, their, their right is not, uh, it's not, it's not recognized. So that's why this is, we need a structural change to uh, eradicate these discriminations and then uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to write a new, a new history of Burma. And uh, as I remember once, uh, once of the ethnic leaders said uh, in his, uh, in, in his speak, uh, he said that uh, our countries have different kind of beautiful flowers. Uh, if we let this uh, flower to bloom, you can imagine how beautiful is that. So uh, we believe that uh, the Burma is blessed with uh, many different ethnic groups and uh, we just have to give the rise to these ethnic groups and then we will see that Burma will prosper and that it will become a, 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 a very, uh, what's that, uh, beautiful countries as the, the leader said, and, and other things. Uh, now we even we discuss about the, uh, the, federal, the future federal issue, but we also face this with the ground, the ground situations as the current situation is our country that our people have to run and, and the SAC, they are, they are bombing, uh, they are bombing the village, they are bombing the IDP areas, it's happened every day and there are, there are many life loss because of this. So we also need, uh, uh, the urgent actions for international community and also our friends in Asia to help us evoke, evoke for this. Uh, we are trying to uh, solve the problem of our political, uh, for the long time of our political uh, issue, but at the same time, we also have to feed thousands of people and we also have to save, we want to save the lives of our people. So we hope that our friends here will, uh, will help us to, to, uh, to pressure the international communities to uh, to take actions or, or the situation. So this is what I want to say for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Motema, um, that uh, uh, that uh, while we are while you are embarked on this extremely ambitious and um, important um, work to uh, draft the principles and guidelines for a future federal democracy your community and all the activists on the ground are also trying to deal with the fact that they are being subjected to a war, to multiple airstrikes and attacks by the illegal junta, and that they are also trying to deal with the humanitarian situation on the ground. So I think we do need, when we're talking about recommendations uh, for uh, the people in Phnom Penh, quite clearly, we need to be able to have a multidimensional response and expression of our solidarity, not just in the quest to change the structural and political situation, um, but also to deal with the current reality that people are still being subjected to daily to um, military violence and that they are also having to deal with humanitarian emergencies. And that is actually a valiant effort by Motema and her colleagues on the ground. Um, I'm going to actually call up our second reactor, um, Shunling Ao, uh, not to be um, confused with Shunli. Um, and um, Shunling is uh, from the Milti Alliance. For many of us, Milti Alliance has been a very exciting recent development in the spectrum of activism, um, using utilizing social media and um, speaking truth to power and maybe also holding us accountable. So Shunling, you have 10 minutes to react to what has been spoken before. Over to you. Thank you. And I've got to say, this has been a very interesting session to start with. And in preparing for this, I actually asked a lot of friends in the multi alliance their views, and especially those from Myanmar, because it's not my view that needs representing in this, it's theirs. And not everybody agrees on everything, including me even attending this panel with the minister on the platform. Um, but everybody shares the dream of a better future for Myanmar. And just before I get into reacting to what's been said in the panel, 
I just want to give one quote that I got back from one of the groups. Um, because I think it shows how carefully the people on the ground think about what they want the future to look like. So just really quickly. So the essence of a democratic system is that the people and their rights, their responsibilities and accountabilities are all clear and equal. These are revealed and upheld through the rule of law and human rights. Our country is inhabited by different, diverse peoples from various faiths, cultures, customs, ethnicities. Therefore, it's key to expand the concept of democracy well beyond what has come before. Working for the rule of law and ensuring that human rights for all exist making a society with a strong foundation of democratic engagement is the only way to protect civil society, ethnic groups, and the people. And again, the reason why I share this is because the young people, the ethnic groups, the CSOs, the unions, a whole swathe of civil society and organizations really know what they want in the future. And they really have a desire and a passion to make sure that it's implemented in a fair way. And just to kind of state my position, I, I believe that the NUG is, is really important in this and that it has built a, a good coalition that's got a really good chance of winning the revolution. But for it to succeed, it needs to build that trust with all the communities and all of the stakeholders and that requires accountability and inclusion in a genuine way. The approach shown by the deputy minister on paper looks and sounds good. The values outlined it in it are key and quite reflective of what I've been hearing from the groups on the ground. But the fear is that while on paper it seems good, the outworking of the eight steps so far taken has not been anywhere near as inclusive enough. Voices have been excluded. Some of the voices that have been included in the room have been sidelined and not listened to. And that is worrying because it needs to be better than that. As I mentioned, I was aware of what the Minister of Commerce had said in the past. And it's quite clear that those words and that racism is still in existence within the NUG and some of the resistance groups. And if I'm honest, the excuse that we heard from the minister, it wasn't an apology, it was an excuse. And excuse my language, but it was bullshit. Um, in fact, it's a clear example of not taking responsibilities of the words or actions in the past. You can see it in the argument, the, the, the very, very robust debate happening in the chat. And it's not just the minister. There are others whose actions as well as words in the past give not just the, the Rohingya, but other ethnicities and other groups pause. Um, the lack of that accountability undermines the call for unity. It makes potential allies both inside and outside Myanmar hesitant because the history shows that if this is not dealt with properly, it will repeat and those specters of the recent past loom really large. Um, and I'm quite shocked about some of the weaknesses of the sanctions outlined in the, the security forces um, information and the security accountability that the minister uh, presented. Uh, not being promoted and getting a budget cut for your department or whatever isn't justice or accountability. They're not really deterrents against abuse in the future. It's actually just not strong enough it doesn't doesn't meet the standard of what was shown and displayed and the values shown and displayed 
by the Deputy Minister of Human Rights. Um, and if we, we talk about the words of regret that have been spoken, sometimes in passing, maybe without care, they don't weigh much in comparison with what came before because the actions don't tend to follow. And in that respect, it's really important that the mistakes and harms from the past are addressed directly. Those apologies are made openly and cleanly and without excuse and without justification. The actions to ensure inclusion, and this is at every level, need to be genuine and tangible. It's You can't just have token advisors. You can't just have partial, oh, well, they're in the room, so it's okay, but then actually they're ignored. Um, the voices from all sectors of society have to be heard in shaping what is being built, because that's the only way to build the trust. It's the only way to ensure that the coalition against the junta is strong and the future can be better. And that's vital. All of the peoples and stakeholders need the NUG not to be just not the hunter, but they need it to actually be transformative and inclusive and bold in that inclusivity to, to build that trust, to heal those wounds across numerous contexts. We know that the, the struggles in Myanmar go back all the way to its founding. And we could talk about like how a lot of those problems were were partly the British. And uh, yeah, we should uh, <laughs> recognize that. But the hope of so many people that I've spoken to, and the hope is that the NUG will become that transformative, inclusive leadership that helps shape Myanmar into something so much better because the desire from the for a true grassroots transformation within society is strong with so many of the activists and groups on the ground they want a system that serves the people and takes care of their needs yes hunter need removing the root and branch absolutely that has to happen it's absolutely key but that's the start not the end of the process it is the beginning, as large as that task seems. Because the hope and desire and the goal for a better Myanmar, where the opportunity for all, where children can go to school without fear, where it doesn't matter if you were born Chin or Kachin or Shan or Karan or Bama or Kaya or Rohingya or uh, Mon or Arkanese or any of the other ethnicities, where it doesn't matter what religion you are, your gender or sexuality or social economic status, you're still treated equal under the law. Your rights are still protected. That's the goal. Where the knock on the door is that of a neighbor and not that of the security forces or some other threat. Where the rights of all are defended, where the economy doesn't leave people scraping for a living, where people have a real say in how they're governed at all levels. And like, that's the goal. Like a Myanmar that meets the needs of all of its people in their glorious and incredible diversity and passion, which has been on display for 640 days, I think, in their resistance. Their creativity has been incredible. And if that is the goal, one has to ask why aren't all of the NUG and all of the NUCC acting like it is. There are some that are, plenty that are, but it has to be all of it to make this work. There can't still be voices excluded when they've asked to have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And I recognize there are many priorities and I don't know how much time I've got left, but the foundations you laid down run now. Out of time. Sorry. Sure. Wind up, please. And I think I think I've said basically everything that I, I need to say on this. Um, the NUG is pivotal and leading on this. Um, 
and they need to be better because it's the hopes and dreams of all the people that they carry um there can't be a greed for power there can't be elites that hold hold power in the future um power needs to be devolved all the way down to the grassroots and uh yeah sorry i've over overshot Thank you so much, Shun Ling, uh, for that um, impassioned reaction uh, to uh, some of our speakers. Um, because uh, we're running out of time, um, we, uh, you should note that there's been a huge question and answer and a lot of comments happening in the chat box, which I will definitely download and save for my own edification. But um, we are also running out of time because our dear interpreter has to leave at 5 p.m. Is there a burning question from the floor? I'm going to give the privilege to our friends in Phnom Penh who have stayed in the room. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question from the floor in Phnom Penh? No hands. Vision? Is there anyone? Yes, no? Would anyone like to ask a question in the room? And please hold your hand and you can leave the question. Would anyone in the room like to ask any questions? No. Okay. Um, I, 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 firstly, uh, since we are running out of time, I'm, I firstly apologize for the late start, which was because of the late ending of the previous session. However, I would really, really like to emphasize and draw out from what has been said in the chat box and what has been said by our speakers. Um, I think, Paul, we're going to have to draw a line there, Paul Greening. Um, one of the things is that it's very clear that we do need to support our colleagues in the movement to ensure that what they are trying to do is in terms of defining and creating a genuine federal democracy for Burma, Myanmar, is supported. This is a long and complicated um, uh, uh, situation, but we also need to ensure that um, they are supported in terms of dealing with the ongoing violence by the illegal military junta, and also in dealing uh, with the humanitarian crisis on the ground. So in terms of recommendations, supporting a process in which there's genuine participation and leadership from different minority groups, including, uh, uh, we're talking about Rohingya, Kareni, Karen Kachin, and, and many of the other groups in terms of ethnicity, religious minorities, but also social minorities like um, the LGBT community, uh, LGBTQ plus community. So we can already see that is part of the recommendation. We also need to recognize that some of the dynamics and tensions in these discussions are largely reflected in other situations in other countries in Southeast Asia. It might not be the exact context, it might not be the exact details, but you, I, I'm sure friends from Cambodia, friends from Thailand, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from the Philippines, from Laos, from Vietnam, from Cambodia, will be able to relate to the question of trying to attain equality and anti-discrimination to uh, break down the structural barriers that provide, uh, that, pro that actually, um, prevent protection of minorities in this situation, the protection and promotion and the fulfillment of our human rights. On that note, I would like to thank the co-organizers, uh, the Thai Action Committee for Democracy in Burma, TACDB, Bridges MM, Oxian Burma, the workshop coordinator, Brishan, 
um, our workshop reporter who is tasked with trying to bring forward these recommendations to the APF plenary, to our APF ACSC hosts in Cambodia. Thank you for having us. And to our speakers, um, Deputy Human Rights Minister for the NUG, Kun Baham Tan, uh, Rohingya activist Yasmin Ola, uh, NUG Minister for Commerce, Dr. Kim Mama Mio, um, Ko Tetsue Win from Synergy, Shunling Ao from uh, Milk Tea Alliance, and of course, Mote Ma for her very inspiring and moving internet reaction. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the people who joined us today, both uh, in person in Phnom Penh and online on Zoom and Facebook Live. We also need to remember what Shunling and what Yasmin Ola, who couldn't join us because it's 3 a.m. in her time zone, said, we are not just fighting for accountability for past crimes. We also need to hold the national unity government accountable. And that means that we cannot just uh, depend on uh, Dr., uh, Susanna, uh, Susanna Lala So and um, Aung, Mio, uh, Aung Mio Min, a Minister for Women Affairs and Minister for Human Rights, and Kun Baham Tan uh, as Deputy Ho uh, Human Rights Minister to be the kind and gentle, uh, equality-oriented face of the NUG. The NUG has to be in accountable for ensuring that it embodies in all its cabinet the principles of human rights, equality, and democracy. Thank you so much for joining us. And everyone, please be strong, be safe. And if you can't be safe, be stronger. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. I'm saving the chat to read later. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Take care, David. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you joining us. Much. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.